The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Stature Ministries was the mandate that we were given by God to bring the body of Christ to the place of maturity. The emphasis will always be change lives and maturity. Um, And in order to do that, there had to be an emphasis. And that first column is we had to teach people to become God-focused in a moment-by-moment relationship and how to practice that. Secondly, we found that people need to let God search their heart rather than them searching. Self-search people will go like this. Here's a typical answer. Uh, I can't think of anybody I need to forgive. All right, that is a telltale sign that you're not letting God search your heart. You're trying to figure it out yourself. Jennifer says that physiologically, there's 2,000 thought patterns in your head at any given time. All right, constantly. It's Most of them are these this chair's too hard, I'm cold, I'm hot, uh, I'm hungry, whatever. You're wasting most of those 2,000 at any given moment too. Uh, But when you say, God, search my heart, he goes not to the 2,000 conscious, but to the 400 billion non-conscious. David said, search me, O God, for secret faults. You really want to get serious with God and you want to mature, you let him do the searching, not you. You let God search your heart. Let Him go into those places that you're not even aware of and let Him bring them to the surface and then bring them to death on the cross so that on the other side, resurrection life is produced. The third area is God protected. No matter how long you've been in the church, this first column is basically teaching people how to let the shalom, the supernatural peace of God, guard their heart and their mind through Christ Jesus. Because most people, look at me when I do this now, most spirit-filled Christians who've been around for 20 or 30 years, are we talking to the mature or the ones that have been around a long? When they are in an unpleasant or hostile situation, the first thing they do down here is they put up a wall like, "Uh uh-oh. That is self-preservation. That is the door of the heart. That is your will. And what you're saying is, I'm not, my heart, my head might have to listen, but my heart's not open. And what God wants to teach people is that when you sink into his presence and peace guard your heart and your mind, that peace is impenetrable by the enemy. It guards your heart. It really does what the Bible says, but most people are afraid to try yielding and trusting in God in a hostile environment. Most people protect themselves with the wall. That wall is the door of the heart. It's the will. So everything we teach is basically an amplification of these same things. Matter of fact, we just received our, our fifth book, actually nine if you count the children's books and, and uh, another one, but this, all of these books are basically teaching you how to be God ruled or how to make Jesus Lord, not just Savior, but Lord. What we are in the process of doing right now is revealing four major truths to the body of Christ. I'm summing up all of our books today. This is a summary. This is a state of the ministry. Uh, message, all right? Those middle two columns, the codependent and the carnal, we're believing for a supernatural graduation to where a believer, no matter how long you've been in the church, your mindset is going to change and move to a higher level. Those middle two are basically, you can be saved for 20 years and still be stuck in the middle two. The middle two is the areas where the mysteries, the revelation needs to impact your heart to facilitate transformation. Lastly, and many of your uh, 
people from years past that really had deep, intimate relationship with God would have referred to that last one that we call discipler, to where it's basically what many have called, Norman Grubb called it, the replaced life. It's to where it's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives through me. And you are God ruled, but others oriented. There are people in the carnal and the even codependent category that are others oriented for the wrong reason. All of that we teach is how to deliver the believer from those middle two categories to get their life squared away in the first category and ultimately serve the purposes of God for their generation in that last category that we were called and commissioned to go e into all the world. That's everybody. That's not just a few. And so I'm believing God's raising up mothers and fathers in the days ahead. Four truths. This is the big picture. I'm going to give you the macro before I give you the micro. The macro is four revelations to maturity or what we're calling full stature or what the Bible calls full stature. Four major truths. Two of them are considered biblically mysteries. A mystery is something that can only be known by revelation. A mystery is a veiled truth that requires supernatural revelation to be understood. The first mystery or the first revelation, point one of four, is that Jesus is the Word. You need to know that not theoretically, but experientially through a relationship. The Word is not ink on a page, but it's a relationship. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. And I love 1 John 1, 3 explains that. The Apostle John is talking about how wonderful it was when Jesus walked the earth. He says, our hands have touched Him, our eyes saw Him, our ears have heard Him. And you know what? We're still enjoying that. Only now we're enjoying it by the Spirit because He's no longer here in the flesh. He's resurrected. But the relationship's only lifted to a higher dimension. We're still fellowshipping with Him and our joy is full and we want you to participate in that same joy. That's relationship. That's not, they didn't go from a, a Jesus in His earth walk to a, a theoretical relationship. They went from the spiritual union and communion of knowing him as a person where they touched him, saw him, and heard him, and they're saying, I'm still touching him, I'm still hearing him, and I'm still seeing him. And to make your joy full, I want you to participate in that same fellowship. So that first mystery is that Jesus is the Word, and the way the Lord revealed it to me the very first time was he took me to the, the uh, scripture in Hebrews 4.12. The Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, able to divide asunder. Now while I'm saying that, and I've said this before, you're picturing ink on a page, aren't you? The Word of God is quick and powerful. You're picturing your Bible. The Word of God is quick and powerful. But verse 13 says, all things are naked and open to the eyes of Him. That Word that is living and active is a person. And it's in you. It's the Word in you. The second mystery or revelation is basically that Jesus is in you. Remember when Jennifer and I was traveling for 12 years, church to church, we would say, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Where's Jesus? And the whole congregation would point to heaven. We've got to bring that back into a more internal moment-by-moment -moment reality. I believe that what we're restoring back to the church is the abiding life. Abiding in the vine, not theoretically, but in, in actual experience, experientially. A moment-by-moment -moment relationship. The third truth is that we must teach people to become aware of how the soulish nature does not understand the things of the Spirit. And we used to see people that, that would basically say, well, I'm a, I'm a head person. Almost like they're proud of it. But 1 Corinthians says the soulish man or the natural man doesn't understand the things of the Spirit. So don't be proud that you're a head person. Submit that head and get it to be comfortably subordinate to the Holy Spirit within. That's the proper use of your head, right? Under the authority of the Spirit. 
Jesus rule. So we saw that our training required inspiration before education. We couldn't activate somebody that if they weren't aware of the spiritual realm. Somebody could talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit, praying in tongues. They could talk about that till the cows come home, but if you haven't done it, you're missing out, right? It's the same thing with, with the spiritual awareness for training. You can't train somebody that doesn't know how to contact the Spirit of God within them. And so that third revelation is the training must begin with awareness. If you're not aware, you can't train. You can just give people information, but then it lacks transformation. The fourth, in other words, they've got to be aware that there's a spirit world, and they've got to be in a place to where they understand. If they understand the spirit world, then they can accept or reject. You know, binding and loosing is permit and forbid. But you can't permit or forbid if you don't know what's going on. To take proper action or to understand or to discern, to differentiate, you've got to know this is flesh, this is spirit. This is God, this is bad, this is good, this is evil. Until you can make that distinction, you can't even make proper choices. So basically the training must begin in more in the spirit realm. Once you are biblically literate, it's the spirit that gives life. And if you're going to continue in that life, it's not going to be the letter of the law, it's going to be the Spirit. Now, the two will not contradict each other, but God wants us to move to the next step. And I really believe that, that what God's going to do is begin to train us more effectively for the days ahead. And the fourth element is, of all things, one of the most neglected topics in the church. Well, maybe not neglected, but certainly um, not emphasized, and that is the emotions. I don't know about you, but when I was a young Christian, I was taught fact is the Word of God, and faith in the Word of God, and that little caboose called feelings, you don't need it. Hmm? But then that kind of eliminates compassion, and knowing the difference between, between natural love and Holy Spirit love, not being able to tell the difference between lust and love, because you've, you basically have not trained by a reason of use to have your senses exercised to discern. God made you a thinking, feeling, choosing being, and He wanted all three of those to be subordinate to His Lordship. But if you're not aware of one, it's pretty hard to know what's going on, isn't it? And there's no such thing as a relationship, good or evil, that does not require the emotions. The emotions can make bad attachments, and the emotions can make good attachments. And the only true good attachment is a God attachment. When He rules the emotions, the God emotions are the fruit of the Spirit. Emphasize. Now when you look at that chart, all that is, is meant to be is a little bookmark for all of you, uh, so that as a bookmark you can recognize where am I and am I going in the proper direction? You want the first column or the last column? And quite frankly, the first column has to be part and parcel of your Christian walk before the last column will accomplish anything. Do you know there are people who minister to other people because they have a need to be needed, not because it's the love and the compassion of God flowing out? They don't know the difference between love and lust. They don't know the difference between flesh and spirit. And so they go through religious motions. And oftentimes one of the telltale signs is burnout. If you're burned out, there's something in, the, in your trying that was flesh and not spirit. You don't burn out in the spirit. You should be physically maybe exhausted from standing on your feet during a worship service and, and dancing and doing everything that you do, and, but not exhausted from the anointing. Now, having said all of that, I want to give the, really what, what I believe is the word of the Lord, and I want you to listen closely. It's been confirmed this week to me from around the country, uh, different people that I've dealt with. It's, um, when I see a pattern that comes from all different people who don't know each other, and it's all happening all over, I want you to pay attention. Something serious is happening, and I even see the prophetic sig significance to, to that Hurricane Matthew. Here's what the Lord basically was saying. He says that, well, first of all, let me tell you what intercessors got. What did the intercessors got? That, that there is a thrust right now, a movement 
that Dennis and Jennifer are like the arrowhead and the, the people that have caught the vision are like the shaft behind it fully moving in that direction. And God gave us in prayer that this is a time of alignment versus going in circles. Alignment as opposed to going in circles. And then God began to say, he took me to that. Did you know that when, uh, how many know the story that when Elisha wanted to be mentored by Elijah, father, father, he followed him through four cities, right? You're all familiar with that? You know what the first city was? Gilgal, the place of circles. It was the place that if you do not get circumcised in your heart, you will continue to go in circles. And all this week I saw, uh, even in some cases, former sons and daughters that basically kind of shipwrecked, all of a sudden hearing the, the call to return. Then I've seen other ones that decided to just go in a circle. And basically it was even like they kind of suspected that this Hurricane Matthew was going to go up and around and do some weird thing like perhaps even go in a circle and come back around, which hurricanes do weird things, don't they? But in that context, I saw Jeremiah 17, God saying, those that trust in the Lord will be planted and they will bear fruit, planted, rooted. The tumbleweed in Jeremiah 17 are those who trust in man. And that could be trusting in your own intuition, trusting in your own reasoning mind. It says they will be like a tumbleweed in the desert. And even when provision is brought before them, they won't recognize it because they're a tumbleweed and they're used to going in circles. They're, it's like I'm going to miss something if I don't keep going in the circle. I'm, I'm going to, uh, I've got to find something. When in reality, God says, even if I put the provision right in front of you, you don't know how to get rooted and you don't know how to go in a straight line. But I'm calling for alignment. I'm calling for the body to come together. God has placed within everyone a, a pattern. Uh, I think in terms of grids or overlays or uh, in the olden days, remember transparencies. You know, you'd put it on a projector. I think that way. And the one that I saw was all of life is divine appointments. Entertain everybody as if they were an angel because these divine appointments can become greater or lesser, divine connections. Now the key word is greater or lesser because that will depend on character, maturity, and rootedness. Divine appointments become divine connections. Divine connections basically begin to, to, to develop and all of a sudden you see those, those connections get stronger and stronger and there's greater and lesser knittings and you tap into a divine order, and I believe that's where we're at now prophetically, divine order or alignment. In other words, why did those people come into my life? What is the purpose of all that? You don't know all the answers. What you need to do is under the Lordship of Jesus, cooperate with that procedure because those divine appointments. I'll tell you what, there's some people that I know, uh, people I had in my pastorate before that wanted to choke somebody, and I'm saying, be patient, don't choke them, let's, let's bring redemption to them, and they turned out to be key in getting some people jobs, some people, they were divine appointments, but you couldn't see the provision because your flesh was in the way. Huh? Be nice to those people, it could be your future employer. Huh? God basically saying those divine appointments produce divine order. And God is speaking alignment right now. But I'm also seeing sons and daughters that are going in circles. And it's, it's basically the inability or the fear to move to another level of maturity. And we're going to get to that. So I saw the tumbleweed, Jeremiah 17. I saw the hurricane, Matthew. I got phone calls all this week from prodigals who are thinking that I think it was better when I was home <laughs> than where I'm at right now. Hmm? And then I've got others are going, I, I think it's time for me to move on. I, I mean, I, I don't know. I just, uh, I'm here for a season. By the way, when people say they're here for a season, I look, you probably don't have the same DNA. You're probably just in a circle looking. Right? That's, that, there's a, that can be fear-based. Now, it's not wrong to transition or to move, but 
It's like if you leave one church, you don't leave angry. That's not an accomplishment. But if you're going to something, you shouldn't. Uh, some people can't transition. If you're going to something, you're not running from something. Correct? Big difference. In other words, if you might have really liked it in third grade, you liked your third grade teacher, but now, oh, woe is me, the end of the year, and I've got a chance to go to the fourth grade. It's a promotion. It's graduation. But yet it's change. And some people would rather be in the third grade and be an expert than be challenged in the fourth grade and have to face new people, new relationships, new everything. But guess what? That's part of life. And you can, you can stay stagnant and go in circles and never really, really uh, make a decision to move forward. But if God says, I'm bringing a divine order, you know, first of all, divine appointments, divine connections, and divine connections are greater and lesser, aren't they? Husband and wife, that's the greater. So don't forget that part. That's the greater knitting, all right? Um, and every husband in Kingdom Life Church asks his wife on a regular basis, honey, what can I do to please you today? Right? You've all heard that? It's kind of quiet when I said that. All, all of you husbands are supposed to ask your wife, what can I do to please you today? All right. Now, the, the fourth element, and this is where I believe we're at. I believe the church is at in a large context, and I believe Kingdom Life Church is participating in that. And that is divine appointments bring divine connections, produces a divine order, or God knits together as he puts together. Not you. He knits it together. You need to cooperate with the knitting. Then he unleashes divine purpose. And I believe that the purposes of God right now are to be fulfilled, even in the hearing of our ears, to be fulfilled to move to a whole nother level in accomplishing the purposes. I believe there's going to be an acceleration. There's no such thing as instant maturity. But there's going to be an acceleration as people begin to graduate from where they're stuck and a willingness to die. And we're going to get to that. And scripturally, uh, where I see that is 1 John 2, 12 to 14. This is the message for today. 1 John 12, 14. 12 to 14. 1 John 2. And it reads, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you've overcome the wicked one. And again, I write to you little children because you've known the father. I've written to you fathers because you've known him who is from the beginning. I've written to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you've overcome the wicked one. God is basically saying it's time to connect with people that are going God's way. The other th illustration I saw was, do you ever seen that, little, that picture of that pride of lions? And it says, hang with people that are going in the same direction. God's been speaking that. And at the same time, I'm watching people shipwreck and go in circles. And I'm watching people all of a sudden lock into internal transformation and saying, you know what? My commitment is even deeper than it's ever been before to press on to serve the purposes of God for your generation. Now, what I see taking place is there needs to be a call to those three groups. I saw that in Hebrews 2.10, the purpose of God as Father was to bring many sons to glory. Do you believe that? All right. Before he was a creator, before he was a miracle worker, he was a father. He did not become a father. He was a father. The everlasting father doesn't just mean he's always going to be the father. It means he always was the father. He was first and foremost the father. Jesus came to reveal the father. He even told Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. And there's three views of life in 1 John. And I believe that what the word of the Lord is for many, that he that has ears to hear, is when I was a child, 
I spoke like a child, I understood like a child, I thought like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. All right? There's some attitudes in the child that's healthy, but if you stay there for 30 years, it reminded me of factory workers. I worked in a factory, and in case there was a layoff, I learned every machine that I could learn how to operate so that if there was a layoff, I could move from here to here. I had men that had more seniority than me. They'd been in the factory for 30 years. I'd been two. I could run eight or nine machines. They had 30 years seniority, and they couldn't really do much of anything, but yet they would be the ones not laid off. And I was like, you know, Christians can be like that. You can have 20 years seniority, but you're operating at, at childlike one-year level. And so somewhere there's got to be a promotion to graduate and a death to the status quo or to the way you view things. And I believe that what Paul was speak I mean, John was speaking to in this audience was not chronological age. He was speaking to the spiritual condition of children, young men, and fathers. And he's still speaking that way. But I'm saying that there's a time for graduation. There's a time where it might be that you need to re reinvent your perspective. So here's the test. You can do this yourself. Evaluate yourself. How do I think most of the time? Not once in a while. I know I was 40 years old before I had a mature thought pattern. <laughs> I'm not talking about once in a while, a little epiphany. I'm talking about your consciousness that is consistently constant. Say that back to me. Consistently constant. Now in 1 John 2, it says, basically, a child's view has a tendency to realize that they are forgiven. I speak to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven. I receive that from who? Father God. I've got a revelation that I'm clean inside. But my revelation is still primarily what He can do for me. And is that good? Of course it is. One of the lessons you've got to learn is that God is there for you. He'll never leave you or forsake you. He's there for you. Nevertheless, you can go for many years and... and, and never grow out of the fact that it is me-centered of what God, blessing-centered. God is able to bless me. And that is a truth. And some, basically, based on their history, they still equate God with a God who is stingy. They're still relating more to being a product of their natural environment than they were of the God creation. I'd say that has to change, don't you? You ever seen somebody that had a view of God much like their father, natural father? That has to change. You've got to grow. A young man's view is, I've overcome the wicked one. The word of God abides in me strong. How do you know the difference between a child and a young man or a young woman? What's the difference? The Word of God abides in them strong, and they've overcome the wicked one. That tells me they got victory in their life. Did you ever go to a depressed person and ask for prayer? No. no. Who, do you, who do you go for to ask for prayer? Somebody's in victory. How about, how about if you're the one who has a dozen people praying for them all the time because you're in spiritual warfare? What would that mindset be? Is that a young man or a young woman? That would be more the child, right? I need, I need, I need. So I'm in a hard time. I'm a, I need 12 people praying for me at all times because I'm always in spiritual warfare. It just might be your immaturity. When I was a child, I thought like a child, spoke like a child, understood as a child. Maybe there's a change that needs to take place there. Is that possible? Yeah. But this is a day of graduation, so I don't care where you're at. We're going to move forward. The young man... And again, this has nothing to do with chronological age. This has to do with spiritual perspective of how do you view life from a Christian point of view most of the time. Say that back to me. Most of the time. Because in reality, I don't care how mature you get, you need to know God is your source. 
but a child only learns them as a source and it's got the gimmies. You can get the gimmies and that's good, but you don't want to stay there forever. You got to do something with your life. The young man is, I've overcome the wicked one. I'm strong. I've got victory. People will be attracted to a person with victory, won't they? The word abides in me strong. The child's view is God is my source. And there's strengths and weaknesses to that. The young man's view is I'm the instrument of God. I'm God's man. And you know what? Uh, me and my friend Sandy Colkin, when we were baby Christians, we stood in front of a congregation and we both said that same thing. And the pastor, our spiritual father, had to go up and say that what Dennis and Sandy say uh, was not bad. It was not arrogant. It was not pride. But I, I'm God's man. I belong. And because I belong, I got a lot to give. You can say that with pride and you can say it without pride. You can say it out of a God confidence or self confidence. Makes the difference. My spiritual father had to explain a lot of things I did. <laughs> well, what, what Dennis really means, you know. But anyway, I, I still have that need, and, but it, God gave me Jennifer for that. Like, if Jennifer ever does that, I'm giving her trade secret away. When she tells you no, it looks like yes. She goes, huh, ah, don't do it. Husbands, if your wife says, okay, can I go play some basketball with the guys? Go. Don't go. You have to, you have to learn these things. This is, requires discernment. All right. Now, where you are at with your vision is basically how you're going to interpret every kingdom message and every thrust of present truth. You know what I mean by present truth? Everything that God is presently speaking as a thrust. A thrust is not an extreme. It's a thrust. It's a message. Now, the father. The father, a spiritual father, wants to be an expression of reality. The highest form of communication is to express what's real, not what you know in your head, not even what you can do. Because that can be an instrument. A young man, let me show you what I can do. Right? And that's a good thing. Because some are doing nothing. Therefore, it's a good thing you're doing something. Nonetheless, the father wants to be an expression and has more joy in seeing the children rise up and become all that they can be. So the child's Christian worldview is God is my source. The young man's worldview is, I'm an instrument for God. The father's worldview is to be an expression. Isn't that what Jesus came to do, to reveal the father? And what he said to Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. What did Paul say as an apostle? Basically, though you have 10,000 instructors, you don't have many fathers. I'm saying the body of Christ needs mature mothers and fathers, not chronological age. I'm talking about character. Because if there's going to be a huge harvest, we can't keep having babies raise babies. And by the way, that scripture, though you have 10,000 instructors and not many fathers, instructors has also been translated boy leaders. The Greeks were big on boy leaders. If you master the material, you teach it. But what's missing with someone who's mastered the material? They're giving information, the life experience, the substance, the, the character has not been fully developed. You're going to need fathers. And you're going to need mothers. And the biggest mistake of going in circles is having peers teach peers. And that's very prevalent nowadays. I'm sorry, but they can only take you as far as they are themselves, no matter how good they are. There needs to be a worldview that changes from child's viewpoint to a young man's. And, and real simple, I used to use this in my church. Now this is in Pennsylvania, this doesn't apply here. But in Pennsylvania I used to use the example that the child's attitude, and it's totally pure, 
says, oh, I'm running late. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, give me a parking place right in front of the church. Oh, and then they get there and they're, oh, there's a parking place in front of the church. They're, oh, they just made their day. They got a parking place right in front of the church. God is my source. Gimme, gimme, gimme. <laughs> the young man has a different perspective. Persec perspective. <laughs> yeah, that too. And he'd say, I'm going early. This is up north. I'm going early to shovel the snow so that people can walk in unhindered into the church for the meeting. A servant. I'm an instrument. I want to honor my father by serving, by actually doing something instead of just looking for a convenient parking place. See, the child is still, it's pretty much, it's, uh, it's not, by no means Christ-centered. They're, they're a believer, but it's pretty much the whole world revolves around them and how everything affects them. As a matter of fact, if they get bummed out, it's because God didn't do what they wanted Him to do, right? That kind of stuff has to transition out to where you grow up. Now, it basically said fathers. The fathers would basically say, I want to watch that one that shovels the snow, and I want to pull the gold out of them. But that also means that they have to be tested. Got to look at their character. Got to look at their rooting system. Got to look to see if they're, what their st emotional stability is like. Can they withstand correction? But as a father, I want them to progress more than I care about what I do. I've already been there and done that. I'm going to continue to do what I'm going to do. And actually, Full Stature was named after the fact that we saw from early on and this gets developed in your life progressively, that God was the everlasting Father. But the macro picture was that the Father wanted to bring many sons unto glory, and that's what I'm part of. And that's never changed, and it's not going to change. So the goal then for me is not a need to be needed, but it's a need to please the Father whose eternal vision in the big picture was that He was always first a, f a Father and He will never desire anything other than to bring many sons unto glory. To carry that Father's heart to bring sons unto glory is the passion that's never going to stop. That's saying that I want to be an expression of His heart. Even though I'm going to have to cultivate that and I haven't arrived, but I'm going to stay focused on that till it emerges more fully and completely, even to the point of a replaced life to where it is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. When a person has that from the onset, what God is looking for is will they align their life regardless of circumstances? Will they deal with what life throws at them in the way of people and circumstances and still joyfully move to that one purpose? And that's why we named it Full Stature. I believe all fivefold ministers are supposed to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry, not just do it themselves. When you have more joy of seeing someone else being equipped and doing it. This is where I spend my whole week. I do not spend on church people. You people are too healthy. I spend my whole week on all of the groups outside of this local church that want mentored on how to more effectively help people. That's where my passion is. In other words, fathers, there's no such thing as retirement. You should be investing in that next generation. To serve the purposes of God for your generation like David did, to serve the purposes of God for his generation or Paul. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. You've got to stay focused on what God called you to be and reproduce reproducers. Now, there is need, and we've got books and materials on it, there is need for people who've gotten stymied because if their earthly father didn't feed, care, was not a source of security, did not protect them, they have to learn God. But you know what? That can be a good thing. Sometimes orphans and those that didn't have a father can learn Father God better because they need to press in and find out what God is really like, as opposed to comparing them in any way, shape, or form to your imperfect parents. And, by the way, even if you had perfect parents. You are not necessarily the perfect child. So there's still stuff to deal with, isn't there? 
right? <laughs> Jennifer, much of the ministry Jennifer got, she goes, my goodness, nobody even did this to me. I did it all to myself. That was her epiphany. I've done, you'd be surprised what you can do to yourself, all by yourself. Now, let's examine our relationship uh, with your earthly father, because we don't want to carry that over. But I want to give a child's view, both the good points and the bad points. Here's the view or vision of a child. Give me, bless me, take me out of my problems, deliver me, provide for me, care for me, take, take away what bothers me. They're usually rebuke, they rebuke a lot. I do not like people or how I feel. What can God do for me? How can he fix my life so I feel better? Those people bug me, etc. Sometimes a child is afraid of father. We've dealt with people over the years that they're, they weren't going to grow and mature until they dealt with that not being afraid of father. I don't care what kind of father you had. I, you, it's how you respond. It's not about whether they were good or bad. It's how did you respond to them. I've seen two children with the same parent respond totally different. One thought the father was a devil and the other one thought the father was a saint. Same family. So your perception is what determines it. So it's really all about you to take control of your own life. A child can be afraid of the father. They can demand that the father changes because they're not happy. Guess what, parents? You were called to be a parent, not their friend. And they would like to change you so that you're in agreement with their whims and wishes. That's not parenting. In a crisis, they demand that something be removed, like a person or a circumstance. They usually have a dozen people or more praying for them. They run to other children for help, and this is the problem that I've seen all week from around the country. I saw the same pattern, and I'm seeing it over and over again. They're going in circles. They're going in circles. Don't they know that the, even if the provision was right in front of them, they wouldn't see it because they're, they're, they're like a tumbleweed. They're trusting in their own flesh of trying to make something happen. And in doing so, like a tumbleweed, there's no roots, there's no fruit. No root, no fruit. It's that simple. But they that trust in the Lord will be planted. And as they're planted, they will bear fruit in all season. Jeremiah 17. Read that. It's tumbleweed Christians right now. It's Hurricane Matthew Christians right now. It's Gilgal Christians going in circles but never, never really knowing how to basically stop the cycle. You stop the cycle by basically saying, I've got to die to my present mindset. This mindset isn't working. It worked in the beginning when you were a child. How many know that when you first got saved, you got answered prayer pretty fast? But later on, he wants you to pursue him. He's not hiding from you. He's hiding for you so that you pursue him and grow up and not get instant gratification. That's great when you're a child. But basically, a child in a crisis can choose to grow up and change and then adjust to a new vision, a mature vision. And as they mature... You build. You do not throw away what works, but you use it as a building block. Rejection comes when you try to control relationships you have no business controlling. This is when God wants you to grow up. Quit controlling relationships you don't have any need of. Growing up means being crucified. Remember what the Lord showed me? Big, big heads in the church and itsy bitsy atrophied spirits. Minister to their spirit, character, attitude, motivation. That's character building. If you fail to mature, you will usually fall into an extreme. If you stay a child long enough, you will fall into an extreme. When God wants you to adjust and adapt to a higher vision, you say no. You then become unbalanced. You're either going to go easy grace or you just get a religious spirit and be a legalist. You, you will go off one way or another. Or... What's happening even now? I don't go to church anymore. I've got people who don't have a local church that are more connected to us in the spirit. Their DNA, I mean, they're sons and daughters, and this is their church, and it's by the internet. Can you imagine that? But I know by my spirit their relationship is real, 
and it's tight. And if they lived here, they'd be here. That kind of relationship. God is saying, I want to take you to a higher dimension. Now let's look at the young man. The young man's view is basically, I'm on the move. Don't discount me. I believe the old vision that God is providing for me, but I've got to make my vision come to pass. I'm God's instrument. I'm God's man of the hour. Is that a good thing? Can be. Being an instrument, it also means you're in victory. That's a good thing compared to a child who needs everybody, pray for me, pray for me, I'm in spiritual warfare all the time. But the attitude God gave you the land, now I need vision for the seed. God gave you the land, you know how to conquer, you've overcome the wicked one. The word of God abides in you strong, you've got victory in your life, you're God's instrument. And your, your mindset most of the time is what you can do and what you need to do to quote, minister. And you can be so instrument oriented that there's a downside to that. That you basically are connected nowhere. You're going in circles. You can fall into the trap, and this is what I've seen as a pastor, and when I've gotten with pastors privately, this is not something we usually say publicly, but there are groups in the church that are highly gifted, but there are opportunists and there are sons and daughters. Do you think there's a difference? You don't hear that word said much, but it's true, opportunists. Opportunists is different than sons and daughters. Some opportunists have to be paid or they won't do anything. The attitude, I'm God's instrument. That's a good thing. The word abides. They're victory over the enemy. I do my own praying. I've got my own relationship with God. Those are good. I try. I persevere. I've got discipline in my life. They have a tendency in the young man to know that when resistance comes, you overcome. What was the difference with the child mindset? Take it away, God. Take it away. Rebuke it. Remove it. There's a place where the young man learns that, you know what, some stuff doesn't come easy. Some stuff is that I'm going to overcome. And actually get stronger in the overcoming. I'm not going to demand instant gratification. I've learned that patience through faith and patience. You notice that they're paired together? Through faith and patience you inherit the promises. A young man, young woman in God has learned enough character, enough attitude that there's some things I'm going to have to hold my heart open to. It's not going to be instant, but I'm not changing my focus. And hope deferred means I shut down. I'm not shutting down. I'm holding my heart open for love never fails. Love's going to come through. I don't know how, when, or where, but I'm going to let love come through in His way. I'm going to hold my heart open and be consistently constant. That's a good attribute for a young man. But they, they graduate from the child's view of everything's easy and everything's handy and everything is somebody ministering to me. You look at your little cards, others. The child is basically like the others. Others pray for me. Others tell me what's wrong with me. Others tell me what to do. Hmm? No victory in my life. Now, the young man, the good points is, is they are responsible to change and their primary consciousness is to honor the Father. When God says, I'm going to take you to the school of the Spirit, Dennis, you know the first principle he taught me? Was every time you close your eyes, Dennis, you honor me. doesn't matter whether you hear, get a word or some great revelation. You honor me when you come to me. You come to me, you draw near to me, you close your eyes, you honor me. He teaches honor first. Honor God. First step in building a relationship. Now, I came to honor my father. I've already learned as a child he provides for me. I got into the word and I saw how to pray for myself. I move enough in the word that I can actually help other people. That's still a young man. 
Now, the downside there is, and I also know it all, <laughs> yeah, hey, all these strengths have a weakness, you know what I gotta say. I've got all the answers. Later, you get to the point where you go, I think a father's perspective is I don't have all the answers and I haven't arrived yet, but there is so much more in him. To graduate into the father's view, he is son conscious. Now, some of you, even at an early age like I did, even as a young Christian, I had a passion for the revelation of the Father. I believed, I was just a baby Christian, and I believed that there has been a, a great historical revelation of Jesus restored to the church. There's been a revelation at the turn of the century of the Holy Spirit. But right now, the next great revelation is a revelation of the Father. For the church to reveal the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And the ultimate purpose is the eternal Father was to make himself known and bring many sons to glory. That's the macro. And that's the big picture. I'm locked into the big picture and then will obey whatever's necessary to accomplish that purpose. But a father is son conscious. They've learned to grow up. They've learned to lay down their vision to bring it to a kind of death in order to know what God knows and found out he knows so much more than I know. And also, the Father's attitude is not just an instrument for God, being obedient to honor Him, but to honor Him also tapping into, I want to invest in other people's vision. Now, here's the trap there. If you're dealing with children and young men, when you invest in their vision, they interpret it two ways. One. He owes me a platform. Is that possible that someone would think like that? They said they would invest in my vision, therefore they should give me a position or a platform. When in reality, to invest, you invest in sons and daughters, not vagabonds, not tumbleweeds, <laughs> right? But sons and daughters. Because you're teaching sons and daughters that, guess what? Just like a friend of mine, he came from Africa and he lives here in Charlotte. When he was leaving, he asked his spiritual father, where do I go to church? Now listen to this, because you don't hear this enough. And in the days ahead, you're going to need this. He says, oh, don't look for a church. Find a father. Now, I'm not trying to sell myself here, but I'll tell you what, that is true of, for me when I was a young Christian, and it was true. There needs to be some, I don't care how independent you are, there needs to be a place that if you're like a prodigal even, where do you go back to? If you're in trouble, who do you go to? Hmm? I had people that were so mad at me in my first church, they said, yeah, I know darn well, I'm gonna go somewhere else. But, they, but you know darn well, if we come back, he'll forgive us. <laughs> At least they got that part of the message right. But a father is to teach the children more than what I know that you're more successful in the days ahead. A father is content to be an expression because here's what's happening. We've got children raising children. We've got peer level advice and that frightens me because I see peer level advice is very dangerous. You've got two people who don't have enough life experience or character to development to really help the other person. It's good to have friends but I'll tell you what, what the Lord showed me was that picture of those pride of lions. You need to hang with people that are going in the same direction. And your direction should be to want to mature no matter what your chronological age is. You should be wanting to mature your, your vision of life. It's not just God with the gimmies. It's not just that I'm an instrument. I've seen people on television that are older than me who are still a young man at heart. So look what I can do. And then there's others that just marvel at what others can do and say, you know what, there's a bigger picture 
than just me and what I can do. There's other people. I want to pull the gold out. But you know, reparenting the church has is, is got a, a glitch in it. The first step, and we shared this earlier uh, a few weeks ago, what's the glitch? They have to feel safe and secure. Children have to feel safe and secure or you can't pull the gold out of them. You try to pull the gold out of them and they'll say you're a tyrant or a dictator. But in reality, you're trying to pull the motive, correct the motivation, correct some of the attitudes. I still remember my friend getting beatings from his father, and he said, I don't understand why you hit me all the time. And he said, what did I do? And he would say, son, it's not what you do, it's your attitude. I think God the Father is looking at us like this. I saw a picture on Facebook where someone says, I think this is my guardian angel. I think that's some of our guardian angels, don't you think? Going, oh. <laughs> what are they up to now? <laughs> but anyway, if you want to go further on this subject, we've got Spiritual Fatherhood. It's a four CD series. It goes into more depth. But I want to bring today as a day of graduation. Don't you, are you willing to graduate? Yeah. Huh? And it's not like this is an instant thing, but yet... There has been in many of the greats throughout history a place where they went and they found a whole nother level in God. But I'm saying in order to at least prepare our hearts for another level or to graduate, we're going to have to be willing to die to an old mindset. Do you have a mindset that has some childish attributes in it? Sure. Then let's just say let's die to that today. All right? And secondly, do you have some young men attributes because you know you can be you can be proud of your independence and independence is such a virtue compared to sickly dependent but it can become a, a double curse you can get so independent that you cannot be part of anything bigger than yourself because you're too independent and you've prided yourself in that independence you are not able to be interdependent you're not able to become part of something bigger than yourself. And there's a word for intercessors too. I don't see it in my geographical area, but like I'm in contact with people around, around the world all week long that are leaders. I'm seeing an unhealthy thing with intercessors. Intercessors have actually exalted themselves in some places to run the pastor on how he should run his church. That is not intercession. That's manipulation. If, God, if you know better than the pastor how to run the church, you should have your own church. Intercession should be a humble ministry. Intercession should be not seen and heard as an, as an office to override the, uh, the authorities. I, I mean, I have heard stories of a pastor in Pennsylvania who got a backhoe and dug up his backyard of the church property because an intercessor told him that the church isn't going to grow until you get those Indian bones out of the backyard. And what she was so repeated that to such a degree, he finally got a backhoe to look for, see if it was an Indian burial site. I'd say, intercessor, you, it's your revelation. You get the backhoe, you dig it up. And then you fix it. By the way, this is a, this is a freebie for all pastors that are watching. The next time somebody has a great revelation of something for you to do, you say, you got the revelation, you do it. Right? So, we're going to graduate today. Are you ready? A few steps to graduate. Let's pray. Father, whether it's childlike attitudes that I have, whether it's young men, I've seen some mature, fatherly thought patterns emerge. But God, I need to die when I was a child, I thought like a child, I spoke like a child, I understood. But I wanted this to be a day of putting it away. I want to move and change my perspective.
As a young man, I don't just want to be mentored, I want to serve. I want to move out of the childish that says I'm entitled. And I ask for forgiveness and repentance to die to the old mindset. And I am welcoming the presence of God to bring within a new mindset, a new vision, a new epiphany. I want to graduate by starting with that decision that I want to part with that old world view, that old childish view and over dependency on ways of thinking, attitudes, appetites. I want to declare them even this day. I decree and declare there are many attitudes and attributes that are immature in my life, regardless of how long I've been in the church. I receive forgiveness for immature attitudes, thoughts, appetites. They're immature, and I want to relinquish them to get a higher perspective of my purpose, to fulfill my purposes on planet Earth for my generation. I want to die to strife and control. I want to stop trying to be the general manager of the universe. I want to stop and die to the thing that without me it all falls apart. I want to die to a superior or inferior attitude. Come on now, listen. Inferior attitude is not humble. Inferior is another form of pride. It's contradicting what God made. I want to die to any superior or inferiority attitude. I want to die and offer on the altar this day that I'm a victim and everybody else is the perpetrator. I've watched people graduate in their maturity. I've seen changed lives, and this was an absolute must for it to happen. You've died to everybody else as the perpetrator, and you're the victim. This slave mentality, victim mentality has to go. Otherwise, you just become what you hate. You who judge, you're going to do the same thing. So I receive forgiveness for judging pastors, leaders, fathers, authority figures, school teachers. I receive forgiveness that is holding me back from being all that God wants me to be. I'm releasing out of my belly's flown a river of loving forgiveness and I'm releasing forgiveness on all authority figures flowing out of me like a river, unhindered, no walls but peace. Calling forth for those people now that have prayed that prayer that we're going to break the circle, we're going to break that orphan spirit and start hanging with people that are going in the same direction. Are you hanging with people going in the same direction? If you're in going in all directions, you're going in a circle. You're on, a, you're on a spiritual rotary. And it will not produce. Find out what God wants you to do. Find out where God wants you. And then commit to doing it fully and completely. When Jesus basically said that he grew up in the revelation of his father. He matured in the revelation. He was adopted, a baby that grew up into adoption. Adoption in the Bible is different than our adoption. Adoption means you matured to the place where you could handle the family business. A son and a daughter would mature to the place where they could do the family business. So Father, right now, we just say, seal this work right now by the power of the Holy Spirit. Bring us into the place of a whole new level of vision 
We're going to die to the childish, die to even some of the young men things, and we're going to become mothers and fathers to handle the harvest as it comes in, that we can help them deal with attitudes, motives, and childlike behavior that, quite frankly, they don't even see it. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com. Did you know that we have an online school available? Hi, I'm Pastor Jason Clark. We invite you to join our international community of almost a thousand students currently enrolled in a school like no other. Team Embassy equips believers to live in the spirit by giving them the how-to tools for wholeness intimacy with God, and living the abundant life Jesus promised us. You will learn how to heal emotional pain quickly and completely. You'll discover amazing keys to tap into the fruit of the Spirit and practice the presence of God as a lifestyle. Exciting courses available include the 60-Day Challenge, Self-Deliverance, Healing Rejection, Codependency, Intimate Prayer, The Functions of the Human Spirit, and many, many more. It's formatted so that you could take it with you on all your mobile devices. Sign up today at training.teamembassy.com. Be transformed. Become all God created you to be. You will never be the same.